In today's episode, we open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 19. King Saul is determined to kill his young rival David, who has won the hearts of the people and the love of his daughter Michael. But Michael and Jonathan, Saul's son and David's best friend, risk their lives to help David escape from Saul's murderous plots. Will David survive the king's wrath? Good morning and blessed Ascension Tide. Today is Wednesday, May 24th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word, where each weekday morning we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. We give thanks to God for the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, whose generous contributions help support Thy Strong Word. LHF is a ministry which provides Lutheran resources in various languages. You can learn more about their translating and publishing work by visiting them online at lhfmissions.org. Please join me in welcoming my guest this morning to help us explore 1 Samuel chapter 19. It's the Reverend Philip Fishaber, pastor of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Good morning, Pastor Fishaber, and welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Great to be with you again. Good. Yeah. The last time we talked, we were, we were, man, that's been a while ago. We were in 1 Corinthians and now we're in 1 Samuel and it's exciting to have you back. How have things been going for you and the saints there at Holy Trinity? Good. This weekend we installed a, an assistant pastor who's also, and his primary duty is as principal of a Lutheran school in a couple towns over that's shared among the local congregations. Oh, well, that's so. exciting. Yeah, lots of good stuff going on then. Um, I'm sure, did he move there from somewhere far away, or is he local? or From Brookfield, Illinois, is where he previously oh, okay. served. Well, good. Well, wonderful. Well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what, we have uh, some exciting text to get through today. But before we do, as always, I'd like to start off with prayer. And also, as always, I'd like to invite you, our guest, to lead us in that prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you preserve us through a multitude of trials and troubles. Give us comfort by the example of your servant David, how you defended him from the unjust hatred of King Saul, how you moved even those close to Saul to be on David's side, and to defend what is right. But help us to know that you are ever our defender and our constant aid in all dangers and sorrows. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. And that is indeed what we're talking about today, Uh, Saul's unjust and in many ways irrational hatred for David. Uh, But before we get into the text, yesterday uh, we also had another instance where David marries Michael, but that's after, I guess, uh, enduring the wrath of Saul because the women were dancing in the street, that uh, Saul had struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands which made Saul extremely jealous. Um, Do you want to cover anything, lay the foundation, or give us some background before we get into our text today? Well, as you said, we've already experienced Saul's hatred of David because he knows that the people like David more, and we will see later on in 1 Samuel that Saul knows David's supposed to be the next king. We don't know when he discovered this, but this hatred of David will continue well past chapter 19. And he does explain that when he's angry with Jonathan, that David's going to take the throne from Jonathan, which Jonathan knows and is perfectly okay with because Jonathan wants to follow God's will, not seek his own glory. 
which in is contrast certainly an interesting. To his yeah, it's an interesting dynamic because you know Jonathan he would have something to gain by David's death as well from a human perspective, right? He would be the next king of Israel. But as you point out, he's more faithful to God than than his father's uh, rantings and ravings. So let's read. I'm just going to read the first seven verses, uh, but uh, we're going to hear how Saul, uh, well, I guess is reconciled, at least for a moment, uh, to David because of his son Jonathan. Here we go. And Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning. Stay in a secret place and hide yourself. And I will go out and I will stand beside my father in the field where you are. And I will speak to my father about you. If I learn anything, I will tell you. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. And he said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have wrought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine. And Yahweh worked a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood by killing David without cause? And Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, As Yahweh lives, he shall not be put to death. So Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all of these things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. So if I'm not mistaken, this uh, attempt to kill Jonathan is like the fifth time that Saul has tried to kill him. Um, but he's he's trying to kill him this this time by enlisting Jonathan to go and assassinate him. Surely the king would know that Jonathan... Um, who delighted much in David, we're told here, but whose friends with David would be like the last good choice to pick to go and kill David. I, I wonder why Saul thought this was a good idea. I don't think there's any rational explanation for Saul's behavior. That's in part why he keeps listening to Jonathan and recognizing, yeah, there's not actually a good reason to kill David. But he yeah, knows the only thing I can think of is threads. perhaps Saul was. I was gonna say the only thing I can think of is perhaps he was thinking that you know, well, if I can just convince David that he has everything to win, you know, by he'll be the king. Uh, but you're right. I think it's incredibly irrational. Yeah, yeah, take us through this part. What what is going on though? Saul's determined. David's a threat to his throne and to Jonathan's throne, which maybe is why he thinks he can persuade Jonathan to be part of this. But Jonathan's not going along with this and tells David and says, basically, give me a chance to try and fix this. You go hide and I'll let you know how it turns out. And yeah, then... and his, his plans are often a little on the convoluted side. This time it's a little better. You know, we're going to hear about him with the arrows and stuff. But at this point, he's he's just saying, you know, I'm going to I'm warning you. Dad's trying to kill you. Just hide and I'll try to intercede for you. And, and I think he does a good job of appealing to Saul with some pretty good reasons why his hatred of David is sinful and irrational. Don't you? Yeah, first he says, David's innocent. He's not done anything wrong to you. But beyond that, he's out there helping you, risking his life for your kingdom as the commander you put over the troops to go fight the enemy. There's no reason to d try and destroy the person who's actively helping you. Precisely. I mean, you know, look at him. He's he's not only killed the Philistine, which I think it's obviously more than just, yeah, this guy killed David. I think it's more that, you know, look at the—of course, he gives credit to Yahweh, which is a, an aspect of David we love. I mean, of John—well, David too, but Jonathan we love. He says, the Lord, Yahweh, used this guy for your good, king, your good. And yet, 
here we go, you know, you're trying to kill him. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Yep, and Saul confirms this with an oath. As Yahweh lives, he shall not be put to death. Saul says, you're absolutely right. No way I'm going to do this. I will completely stop, which lasts to the next couple verses after <laughs> what you read. But That's right. he listens to good reason and to the admonition to follow God at this point. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that this really shows Saul's um, well, we, we I guess we get an indication that Saul is mentally unstable, but aside from mental instability, this really demonstrates a complete spiritual deterioration, right? This guy has no concern for following after Yahweh if he's so willing to swear by God that he won't put him to death. Or on the other hand, in defense of Saul, because he is fickle, Maybe he really means it this time, but it's just there's no way he's going to be able to keep it because of this irrational hatred. Uh, do you have a point of view? Are you, are you more inclined to give Saul the benefit of the doubt that, you know, when he breaks this vow, he, you know, he didn't know that at the time? Or do you think he's lying just to get David back in his sights? Do you have an opinion? I think he means it because we see elsewhere that Saul is very zealous for the Lord. In 2 Samuel, assuming you're going to go on to that next, we even see that he killed people who he wasn't supposed to because he was trying to be more for the Lord than the Lord wanted them to be. And so I think he does mean it, even though he does not stay committed to that promise. But... If we give Saul a fair view, he really does want to serve the Lord. The problem is he wants to do it his way, not God's way. Well, you know what? You very well may be on something here, because what happens next, I guess, leads us to the to a big question. And I'll, I'll save the question until we read it. I'm just going to read three more verses. So he brings Jonathan, right? Uh, Jonathan, pardon me, brings David to Saul. David is back in his presence as before. And we'll recall that the way he was in the presence of the king was he served him by singing to uh, alleviate whatever issues that he was having, this, this harmful spirit. But we read, starting with verse 8, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from Yahweh came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre, and Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear. But he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. So, you know, David's back before Saul. War happens again. David goes out again and defeats the Philistines, which he's so great at doing, obviously with an army as a commander. They all flee, but then we hear this text, which is I think we've struggled with since we first heard it. Then an evil spirit from Yahweh came upon Saul. So if we give him the benefit of the doubt in the earlier section that, that Saul was being honest, he's making a vow to the Lord that he won't put Jonathan to death, are we to blame Yahweh for this attack right here? as he tries to once again kill David, following us being told that an evil spirit from Yahweh came upon him? How might we explain that to people? Well, there are two things going on with this evil spirit, or you could call it a harmful spirit, would be another acceptable translation. The first being the punishment for Saul's previous sins. Going back to chapter 15 and before when Saul's not obeying God, he's told the kingdom's not going to go to your son. I'm going to raise up someone else who's better than you. And it continues on, not all spelled out earlier, but we see this ongoing punishment 
from the Lord because of Saul's sins. Including, of course, that he's trying to murder innocent David, who God has chosen to be the next king. So, it's not as though God's arbitrarily doing this. This is God's justice delivering Saul over to more evil because of his previous sins. That make sense for the first part? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Absolutely, right? So we have, we have David... Um, being, of course, God's chosen one, and the first time this harmful spirit, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, you know, the, the Hebrew text is pretty clearly evil spirit, and people have translated it harmful because they want to separate evil from God, because God, of course, is completely and holy and righteous. Uh, but at the same time, God, as we've talked about before, we don't let him off the hook. If he's always in control, then that means when bad things happen, he may not be the cause or sender of them, but he certainly allows them to happen. And so he's allowing this, this negativity, this harmful, this evil spirit uh, to afflict Saul. But as you so rightly pointed out, this is as a result of Saul's own hardness of heart and Saul's own unfaithfulness. This isn't God's fault. At the same time, though, I do think it's interesting that we have him, this is the seventh time that he tries to kill David. Um, once again, he kills David while David was trying to soothe him by playing the lyre, which is an interesting, and I don't want to make too much of it, but an interesting foreshadowing of David. If David represents Christ, then, then Christ comes to help those, and the same ones he came to help um, attempt to kill him, and of course, in Christ's sake, they succeed. Uh, he rises from the dead, of course. But, but we have David here. He's actually trying to help the king. David, as Jonathan pointed out, has done nothing but serve the king, even though David is the one that will be the future king. So uh, Saul here uh, pins David to the wall. What I also think stood out is that David, um, when he's attacked by Saul, he's attacked because Saul is holding on to his spear. You know, I, I know the, the spear is sort of a symbol of his authority. It's a scepter. But the fact that, that Saul is basically walking around or sitting there with a, with a spear in his hand, right? He sat in his house, where he should be safe, with a spear in his hand. Do you see that as evidence of his, of his instability? Or is there some other explanation of why he'd be sitting in his house with a, with a weapon in his hand? It's possible there was just one sitting close by, but when you get to chapter 21 in a couple days... You'll see David flees from Saul yet again, and he doesn't take a weapon with him because he doesn't have time to go back to his room or the armory and get one. So this is very different than the picture we see of David in just a couple chapters. I can see that for sure. Absolutely. So we have this all going on. You know... Um, <laughs> Despite David fulfilling this military function, obviously he does when it's time, goes off and fights the Philistines, but he continues to play the lyre for Saul in his court. Um, you know, I know we were told by Jonathan that, that um, you know, or sorry, we were told that Jonathan reconciled them. He's back in the presence of Saul as before, but it just seems, I don't know, it seems so inconsistent. How can we maybe rationalize why David continues to serve Saul as king, even though we're now up to the seventh time that he's tried to kill him. This really becomes explicit later in 1 Samuel, where David says, I will not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. When twice he has the opportunity to kill Saul and his David's soldiers are urging him to do so, David says, absolutely not. God deal with it himself when God chooses to, but I'm not going to be involved and sin by putting out my hand against the person who is still the Lord's anointed, because even though God's rejected him, he has yet to remove him from office. So, And I think, I David, think that's a very interesting point. Go ahead, I'm sorry. David shows himself 
a very committed Christian. You talked about him being a Christ-like figure through his service. He's also doing what Jesus commands us to do, to love our enemies as ourselves. David is staying loyal and is not concerned with what happens to him. He says, I will do what is right because that's what God's told me to do. And God will deal with the evil when he so chooses, which is certainly not an easy thing for Christians to do, but it is what God has called us to do. There certainly is a lesson for us here. You know, you have this guy, he's not ruling righteously. He's not ruling even from a position of mental stability. And yet David, who is has already been declared the, the future king, and, and as you said, we find this out later for sure, he doesn't take the opportunity to dispatch the king. He doesn't revolt against him. He doesn't rise up against him, but he serves him and he leaves it up to God. I, I, I can't help but think that this, this type of uh, attitude uh, should be imitated by Christians today as we, as we come before the rulers, the leaders, the princes, the so-called kings of our era. I think we have to remember that despite their faults and foibles, despite our disagreements with them, there's still an aspect of their office and their position that we must respect because there is no authority except from God, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we all prefer to have good rulers who will be a blessing to us, but sometimes and bad rulers specifically as a chastisement for our sins, and we're called to obey them either way insofar as it doesn't go against the will of God, and to accept both the good things we want from the Lord and the chastisements and unpleasant things that despite we, us not wanting to endure them, God also sends us for our good. Exactly. But even though we still see here, and I guess I think a lot of Paul too, who, Paul who's suffering in prison um, under the uh, unjust hand of the governing authorities, and yet he writes us things like Romans 13. He writes us to, to uh, respect the governing authorities, to give respect to whom respect is due and honor to whom honor is due. And, and David is emulating that here. Even Christ himself, when he comes before the governing authorities, submits to their punishment. Of course, he submits to our glory because, um, you know, his glory becomes ours through that death that follows. Uh, but David, here he is. He certainly preserves his life when necessary. He flees. He runs. You know, this section ends with David fled and escaped that night. So he doesn't necessarily say, well, I'm going to accept all sorts of persecution from Saul. But we also don't see him actively working to, to, to uh, I guess, bring vengeance or revenge against Saul. He leaves that up to the Lord. Uh, we're coming up across um, to our break, but uh, anything else you want to add before we go to break? David is unique in that he knows Saul's not going to kill him because of God's promises to him. And we see this when Jesus calms the storm when he's asleep in the boat. He calms it and he says to his disciples, basically, why are you concerned? I've told you I'm going to die on the cross in Jerusalem. Therefore, the storm isn't going to kill us. So David does have a special promise from God to know that he's not going to die. But regardless of whether we know the outcome, we're called to submit and obey God and those God has put in authority. Well, and of course, he also doesn't act stupidly either. Even though he has confidence in God's promise to him, he certainly doesn't put the Lord to the test by hanging around when danger is near. Exactly. Well, I tell you what, why don't we take just a few moments to take a break? But folks, do not go anywhere. When we come back, Pastor Fishaber and I will keep on going through 1 Samuel chapter 19. We'll see you on the other side.
These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan 316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me this morning is the Reverend Philip Fishaber, pastor of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Thank you for joining us this morning. Remember, Thy Strong Word can be heard in St. Louis on AM850, or you can listen live or on demand at kfuo.org. You can also subscribe to the show as a podcast on any podcasting platform. Don't forget also about KFUO's own mobile app. You can listen to this program and many other fine programs. And as always, I'm available to answer any questions you have or to hear your feedback at pastorboo at gmail.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R-B-O-O-E at gmail.com. Or you can find me on Facebook. Just search my name, drop by, say hello. Thank you for being loyal listeners to the program. And now back to the Bible Pastor Fishaber, we just got to the point in our text where David is fleeing for his life, though as you point out, he's confident in God's promises, but still, no reason to hang around if someone's trying to throw a spear through you. Um, So uh, we're going to head into the next section, beginning with verse 11 through, oh, I say about verse 17. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him, that he might kill him in the morning. But Michael, David's wife, told him, If you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let down David through the window, and he fled away and escaped. Michael took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, Oh, he's sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed, with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. And Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go, why should I kill you? All right, we're going to stop there. David has fled now. With Michael's help, his wife, Saul's daughter, um, take us through this section here, right? I mean, some of it's self-explanatory. Saul still wants to kill David, so he sends some guys out to watch the house so that he doesn't escape. But he but he does escape, uh, but I think what happens is pretty significant. Uh, wh- what do you have to share with us? Well, first off, David doesn't flee very far. He leaves Saul's presence, but he's not yet running away entirely. He goes home. And that's what enables Saul to send people to watch the house to try and kill him in the morning. But David is not yet convinced that he needs to entirely leave the area. He just wants to not be around the angry guy with a spear. But Michael sees that Saul sent people to watch the house and tells David, you got to get out of here tonight. Saul's not going to stop in the morning. And so similar to how Rahab let the spies out, when they were in Jericho, David flees out the window, presumably over a wall, or somehow avoids the people Saul sent to watch the house by fleeing out a window and escaping. So what I think is just really fascinating about this whole narrative is, I mean, not only do we have Michael, the the daughter of Saul, in the same way that her brother Jonathan, they both 
betray their father's confidence, right? They both basically lie to their father to help out David. Now, the way she does it is almost comical, I think, in today's <laughs> understanding. She takes an image in, in verse 13. The image here would be a household god, right? And, and so these household gods can be pretty large. So I'm assuming that this is life-sized. And she lays it on the bed, puts a so some goat's hair at his head, so to make it look kind of like hair, covered it with his clothes. So she's basically doing the old trick where you you stuff the pillows under the bed sheet to make it look like you're there sleeping. And she tells them that he's oh he's just sick. Um, kind of a little bit of a convoluted plan, uh, as as just like her brother has some convoluted plans. And, and it doesn't, it's never really going to work because they don't care if he's sick. They're there to kill him. But I guess it delays it long enough. Um, but I just thought that was interesting, taking the household gods. But the fact that Michael has household gods is a little bit significant to why Saul wanted David to marry her in the first place, is it not? Well, this word, teraphim, which is translated image you've called household gods is the point that engenders the most discussion in this whole chapter of what does this word actually mean here? <laughs> because the, we'll take us through it. What are some of the options? Household gods is what you mentioned. That's how it's translated back in Genesis when Jacob flees Laban, Rachel steals the household gods and hides them in her saddlebag when Laban comes looking for them. And sometimes this word is definitely used for idols and sinful activity. Here and in a few other places, it's more ambiguous whether this is a negative word or not. Because this is in David's house. So the dictionaries of Hebrew discuss this at great length and say we should probably go with the neutral term image rather than idol because it's not necessarily a bad thing in some usages in the Old Testament. And Luther, the Latin translation of the Bible as well, just take this as a generic image, which is also what the ESV you read from says. And... I'm, for several reasons, inclined to take it as not a negative thing, even though some instances it is clearly household gods or idols. I don't think that's how it should be understood here. So sometimes I think that when people um, like Luther or even the translators say, well, you know, I guess it it brings me back to the harmful spirit that God sends upon Saul. The Hebrew word is evil. And so they say, well, we can't translate that evil because, well, it's God. So we're going to put a, a more soft term to it. Instead of, I think, sort of understanding more deeply how that could be possible, they say, well, we're just going to soften the word. I tend to think that that's what's happening here. See, there are other explanations. Instead of saying, well, you know, David couldn't have a household god because he's David. But David also goes on to kill Uriah and sleep with his wife and do all kinds of other things that aren't godly. In the same way that we have St. John the Baptist, right, and he sends his people to tell Jesus, and people go, oh, well, John couldn't have been doubting because it's John. But why not, right? People are sinners. David is a sinner. So we could explain this another couple of ways. If we take it the way it's normally translated, I guess instead of sort of torturing it into something that's more neutral because David, we could say that perhaps um, she keeps this teraphim in secret, right? Michael uh, takes the teraphim. Maybe one of the reasons why, and, and scholars have argued this as well, Kyle Dalich argues this, 
that um, the reason why that she keeps this in secret is because perhaps, like Rachel, she has some concerns about uh, about uh, fertility. Um, one of the reasons why Saul knew that that she had done these things, and one of the reasons why that Saul wanted David to be married to her is so that she could possibly lead him astray, despite his faithfulness to Yahweh. So while I certainly can't disagree, it is translated different ways. I, sometimes I'm a little suspicious whenever we soften the translation in order to, I guess, get the man of God off the hook. Because, you know, they can be, we have to shake the gold off the, uh, off the icon sometimes and realize that they're regular people too. But anyway, even if Michael has this thing hidden, of course, it being close to life size might make that very difficult, especially in David's house. Um, it's also Michael's house too. She lives there with David. Um, so it, it could, could be more be of like, yeah, it could, it could be more of like a bust and not a full statue. All it really has to do is stand in for a head from people looking in through the doorway. So it doesn't have to be full sized, maybe just full head sized or something. I do think in fairness to Saul, when we see his zeal for getting rid of idols and sorcery elsewhere, I don't think that it's fair to assume that Saul or his household would just have idols sitting around, and they're never condemned for that in the Bible. Saul's condemned for plenty of other sins, but idols are never mentioned and the prohibition against images that other denominations take as the second commandment is not an absolute no representation of anything allowed because we see god command his people to make images for the tabernacle and the temple and various prophets do it at different times so I think oh, sure. there is right. reason well, 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 to no be open. idols are mentioned unless we take this of course to be an idol. But secondly, you know, Paul Saul, you're right about Saul, he condemns all the uh, sorceries and witches of course until he goes to one. And he goes to the witch of Endor and tries to summon up Samuel against his own command. So, you know, there's also aspects where he could be exerting uh, uh, power over people that aren't isn't exactly isn't exactly with holy intentions, although it might go along God's rules. Because I also think about, well, what is the motivation of Michael here? You know, is Michael, out, out of her great love for David, trying to let him escape? Or could Michael be influenced by her desire to be the queen of, of Israel? You know, we could get into those things. Um, and, and by the way, completely as an aside, if we're talking about translations, um, I, I'm sure you know, but the, the idea of the pillow of the goat's hair is also a little bit in dispute. The Septuagint has an incredibly interesting translation. Its translation is not goat's hair, but a goat's liver, which, I, by the way, I think is incorrect. But being the Septuagint itself, for uh, uh, hundreds of years, people were preaching this as being a goat's liver so that it's still living movement could uh, indicate life under the covers, which, you know, is, I think, the kind of way we sometimes take the translation we use and then sort of force a meaning into it or a reason into it, which instead we could have just said, no, that doesn't make sense that it would be a goat's liver. Let's look at the word again in Hebrew. And of course, it is more consistent with hair. I don't know if you found that uh, interesting or not. Yeah, the the so-called Septuagint is not one book. It's a bunch of different translations into Greek of the Old Testament books. It wasn't one group sat down, did the whole Old Testament all together. And First and Second Samuel are not the most reliable translations into Greek because you have different quality in each different one. Precisely. So. Though, right, that was, my, that was yeah, my point. Yeah, unfortunately, it became used without reference to the Hebrew for correction for many years, which is why we always have to go back to what God actually said and not rely solely on translations, because 
even the best translation can't convey everything perfectly. And as you said, it's an evil spirit from Yahweh. But if you're just reading a Bible translation, say in church on Sunday morning and moving on, harmful spirit may better convey the sense of what God's doing without having to go into a full explanation of God's justice, etc. And so no translation's perfect. You have to balance them all and always go back to the original of what God actually said to clear up confusion or errors as in the case of a goat's liver. Right, exactly. Or as in the case of teraphim, which means mm -hmm. an idol or items used for divination, household gods, right? Because that, that's the word that they use here. And every translation, I think you would agree, is also an interpretation. So when they translate, you know, evil spirit to, to uh, spirit, uh, sorry, to harmful spirit, I guess to defend God, um, I guess, as you said, to kind of water it down so you don't have to explain it, perhaps the image here is taken so that, you know, it doesn't connotate David with household gods. And I'm just saying I think there are some alternate explanations for that that are more consistent with the actual Hebrew word. But I do think there's plenty more for us to dig into, so let's move on. Uh, starting with uh, verse—actually, no, I don't want to move on because I want to talk a little bit about Michael's lying. So Michael answers Saul, he said to me, let me go, why should I kill you? A couple different ways to understand this. Either David actually said that, which is inconsistent with the text, or she is lying. But of course, God detests lying. So we have that question, is Michael right to deceive and lie if God hates lying and expects people to tell the truth? We've had that conversation a couple of times on this program when it comes up from time to time because we see occasions where God's people, faithful people and unfaithful people, lie, but they do it for good reasons. How might you explain to a Christian why, in this case, lying was okay, but in other cases it's not? In this case, Michael is lying to save her own life. Saul is trying to kill his son-in-law his best commander, the person who helps him when he's afflicted by an evil spirit. It's really hard to get closer to Saul than that, except for Jonathan. If Saul is willing to kill David in his irrational rage, Michael looks at that and says, I might be next in line if... I tell him, I saved my husband because you're in the wrong, Father, and he's in the right, and you shouldn't kill him. Not likely to yield a favorable answer like when Jonathan talked to Saul earlier. Now, so you see different... it as more selfish motivation on her part than to help delay the whole idea so that David could escape. I think it's legitimate action of self-defense. She stayed behind and it, to delay them. So this is her method of getting out of it because they basically split up. David fled. Michael stayed behind to slow them down. They've had messengers go back and forth a couple times, buying David that time. And now Michael's saving herself from Saul in a different method than David fleeing. But David wouldn't have left her behind if he thought she was going to be killed by her father. Yeah, I think there's some evidence here that, you know, Jonathan has already helped David escape in the past and no punishment, at least not of death, was coming to him from... I mean, yes, Saul was upset at him at the beginning, but then that he escaped that punishment of death, I think Michael could have expected the same thing, being the daughter. 
So her lying here certainly was self-preservatory. I certainly wouldn't deny that. Um, but I think sometimes we recognize that in a sinful world, we must recognize that in a sinful world, um, not everything is, is super black and white. And I guess we always tend to give David the ultimate benefit of the doubt in everything because he's David. But then Michael, who I suppose isn't as righteous of a character, we kind of give her negative connotations. So David escapes not because he's afraid for his life, because he, he trusts in God that he'll be preserved, but for, I don't know, what reason? If he's going to be preserved? But then Michael, her motivation is automatically negative because she's just wanting to be queen. And that's what I noticed when I was reading the, the various commentaries. I just thought that was kind of fascinating, that David always gets a pass regardless of his sin. And, and in Michael and some of the other characters, they tend to always be the worst construction in the commentaries. Um, yeah, I always I find that there's any fascinating. Ground. Yeah, I don't think there's any ground for saying Michael's terrible here. She and David are both doing what they need to do to protect themselves. And in the next chapter, Saul even tries to throw a spear at Jonathan because he's mad at Jonathan for protecting David. And he's angry enough he throws it at his own son. Right. So... Saul is out of his mind with rage at David here and in the next chapter, and everyone's trying to preserve themselves. And this isn't like the midwives lying to Pharaoh to protect the Hebrew children and doing it to save someone else, but Michael still did all of this to save David and is now trying to keep from being Saul's neck victim. And I don't want to make that seem like she's selfish or bad. She's risking her life to save David right now. Right. And yeah. she deserves the credit for that and not to be painted as, oh, she just wanted to be queen and she's a liar and a bad person. <laughs> right. She has yeah, and that's what I found on, fascinating. But not here. <laughs> that's what I found. Well, sure, sure, but that's what I found fascinating among the among the uh, uh, among the commentaries. You know, it just it, it's funny how some of the the people of God they obviously give passes to, and some of the people who aren't particularly faithful, it's always sort of a negative connotation, like they're a an unreliable witness. But I do want to read on because what happens next is also is fascinating and deserves the equal amount of time that we gave to all the different variants here. Uh, starting with verse 18, I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah, and he told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Nioth. And it was told Saul, Behold, David is at Nioth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. When he was told Saul, he sent other messages, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again and a third time, and they also prophesied. And then he went himself to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Secu, and he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. And he went there to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also, and as he went, he prophesied until he came to Naoth and Ramah. And he, too, stripped off his clothes, and he, too, prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus people say, is Saul also among the prophets? So <laughs> this is an interesting interaction, if not sort of cosmically humorous, because First of all, you know, he's seeking to kill David. He sends after him. David's over there hanging out with Samuel. He sends messengers after messengers after messengers who, you know, the definition of insanity is trying the, the same thing and expecting different results. He does that. And then he ends up buck naked prophesying with Samuel and the other prophets. I have a lot of questions, but I'll I'll hold them to see how you take us through this. Okay. Well, first Assuming we have accurately identified the site, David is about two miles north of 
where Saul's palace is at Gibeah. So he flows, but he goes to the prophet of the Lord. And as we see, David is entirely safe there with Samuel, even though geographic distance is actually pretty small here. Now, this form of prophecy, we call it ecstatic prophecy, was pretty common in the ancient Near East and in the Mediterranean world. And so this wouldn't have been something unheard of. It's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. But this was a regular form of prophecy that people would not have been surprised to see happening, even though it is very bizarre from our perspective today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And so... So what exactly is... Earth... Well, help us understand what exactly is going on then, because, you know, it's being done under the tutelage or the authority of Samuel, the prophet of God, and we're told specifically that the Spirit of God is coming upon them. So this ecstatic prophesying, like, I, maybe you don't know, but like, what kinds of things are they saying? I mean, what, is, what does that prophecy look like? Why are all these messengers joining in? And even Samuel himself joins in. And then I guess I have to add to that, it it, it, is, it seems because it says, and he too stripped off his clothes. Is this something that's done completely in the nude? And and what is all that telling us? Because the next chapter goes into David just fleeing from there somewhere else. So what are we being told by the Holy Spirit here? What what's the what's the connotation behind the prophets and then Saul all coming together to do this prophesying? What what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, we don't know exactly what they would have been saying because Scripture doesn't record what they said. It's quite likely they were just praising God. Maybe they were predicting the future, but sometimes prophecy is just repeating God's word and giving him praise. They weren't necessarily completely naked. The Hebrew word that they strip off translated clothes is outer garments. So they may or may not have been naked. It's not required by the Hebrew text, but they were not dignified in his kingly majesty. This is Saul either naked or stripped down basically to his underwear what would appear to someone walking by as ranting and raving. It's called ecstatic because they're acting as though they're completely out of their minds. This is wild behavior, probably screaming and shouting, maybe singing, running around. This is not the image a king would ever want to portray of himself. But we see that God takes Saul and all his military might and his authority and says, you're going to stand in front of my prophet and prophesy in the least dignified manner possible to show who's actually in charge here. I like it. I like it. God's in charge, and we are at the end of our time together, so we'll have to leave it there. But uh, yeah, absolutely a humiliating uh, position for Saul to be in, certainly a reminder of who is truly king. Well, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Philip Fishaber, pastor of Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Walnut, Illinois. Uh, just great having you on the show. Good discussion, brother. I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. Looking forward to it, too. Folks, please join us tomorrow for 1 Samuel chapter 20. David and Jonathan's friendship is put to the test as, well, King Saul becomes increasingly jealous of David's popularity and his success. This time, Jonathan helps David escape by devising a pretty convoluted plan for David to stay away from the royal court during the upcoming festival. And despite the danger of it all, Jonathan remains loyal to David and loyal to God 
their bond of friendship continues to grow. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we all pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.